Thank you so much. It is truly an honor and a privilege to be here. I, uh, when I think of Passion City, I think of that passage where Jesus is delivering the Sermon on the Mount, and he talks about a city on a hill. And uh, that's how I picture Passion City, a city on a hill that shines this message of God's grace and hope all over the planet. And so I come here with uh, awe and wonder at what God is doing through this great church. So thank you for being here. I'm privileged to be here. My wife, Leslie, is uh, with me as well. And uh, although I got to be honest and say, um, after what happened to me in Little Rock, Arkansas, I'm glad to be anywhere. Um, Because I I was in Little Rock to speak at a charity event. And this pastor picks me up from the airport. And we're driving to the event. And we're chatting along the way. And he says, yeah, he says, I I told a young woman in our church, I said, Lee Strobel's going to speak tonight. She said, oh, the guy who wrote The Case for Christ, is he still living? (laughs) I'm glad to be anywhere after that. I'm glad to be breathing after that. But uh, Leslie and I recently moved to Houston, Texas. Any former Texans here? Yeah, a few. Yeah, yeah, these smart ones came this way. Um, But uh, we got our phone number assigned to us by the telephone company when we moved into our house. And you may think, yeah, big deal. It was a big deal to us. Because no kidding, when we lived in Chicago, the phone number they gave us was one digit away from the cab company. (laughs) Seriously. So two in the morning on Saturday nights, these drunk guys in bars would call for a cab. They'd misdial. Our phone would ring. It was bad enough to get waking up in the middle of the night, but then you had to get up, get dressed, get in the car. <laughs> it was such a hassle. So I think we got a good number this time, I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, so less than I get the opportunity these days to travel around the country, around the world, and, and talk to people about Jesus. It doesn't get any better than that. Whether it's to one person or a bunch of people, it doesn't matter. Um, but I will say, there are some times when I get into a conversation about Jesus and it does not go well. (laughs) I had the most embarrassing thing happen. I was down south speaking at a conference with my buddy Mark, and the next day we had to fly home, so we had to get some breakfast, and we saw one of these Cracker Barrel restaurants. You've seen these, right? I'd never been to one. He said, well, let's give it a try. So we noticed they have rocking chairs on the front porch where people sit and people watch while they're, you know, waiting for a table or whatever. So in order for us to get to the front door, we had to walk in front of two people in rocking chairs. First one was a young woman, about 18 years old, dark hair, dark eyes, young man sitting next to her, about the same age. So we got to walk in front of them to get to the door. That's not a big deal, right? So we're walking along. And just as I step in front of this young woman, I hear her say, what's a deist? And I thought, I just wrote a book about that. So I turned on my heel, looked and asked the young lady, a deist is someone who believes that God created the universe, and then he walked away. A deist is someone who believes that God sort of wound up the universe like a giant clock and is just letting it tick down. I said, a deist is someone who believes that God is distant and disinterested in us. But I said, that's not what the evidence shows. I began to give her all the evidence uh, for God's involvement with the cosmos, God's involvement with humankind. So I give her these statistics, all this uh, data. I started talking about the evidence of cosmology and physics and biochemistry and genetics. I'm just laying this stuff on her, and she's looking at me, and her eyes are getting bigger. And I, I'm on a roll now. You can't stop me. Talking about Jesus, everything in human history, the incarnations, his miracles, his death. I started to give her the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. And she's staring at me, and her eyes are getting bigger and bigger. I turned to my friend, and I said, can you believe this? Happened to walk in front of her. She said, what's a deist? My friend said, Lee. She said, buenos dias. <laughs> I really wish that were a joke. That's what happened. It was, it was, she was freaking out, by the way. I, I'll, I'll give her that. But that was so embarrassing. But you know what the good news was? The ice was already broken. (laughs) How do you not get into a spiritual conversation at that point, right? And it turned out that she was there with her boyfriend for the state track meet. And they brought us back to the hotel room where the coach was and all the athletes. And we got to talk about Jesus for about 45 minutes. So it turned out all right. Man, that was embarrassing. That That was embarrassing. So when I got this kind invitation to be with you today, I thought, well, what can I talk about that is not going to embarrass me? And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do something simple. I'm just going to tell you a story. It's a true story. It's my story. It's a story that begins in atheism. Because I decided at a rather young age that God does not and cannot exist. 
I mean, I, I thought that God didn't create people, but people created God. Why? Because they're afraid of death. So they made up this idea of heaven and an afterlife to make themselves feel better about dying. That's what I thought. I mean, I, I just thought <laughs> the mere concept of an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe, come on, it's crazy. It wasn't even worth my time to check out. Now, granted, I'm a skeptical person, sort of in my DNA. You know, my background's in journalism and law. You can imagine you put those two things together? What kind of a jerk? That you, skeptic, what kind of a skeptic <laughs> that you get? I was a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune newspaper, and we used to pride ourselves on our skepticism. You know, we wouldn't accept anybody's word at face value. We always wanted to try to get two sources to confirm a fact before we print it in the newspaper. So no kidding, we had a sign in our newsroom that said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> How do you know? Maybe she's lying. Got any proof? Got anything to back that up? And that's okay. That's all right. You want journalists to be skeptical, don't you? Sometimes don't you wish they were more skeptical than they are? But my problem was that my skepticism bubbled over into cynicism, and it cemented me into my atheism. Now, because I had no belief in God, I, I really lacked a moral framework for my life. And I'm not saying all atheists think this way. I'm just telling you the way I looked at the world. I tend to be logical. I tend to be rational. So I said, okay, if there is no God, if there is no heaven, if there is no hell, if there is no judgment, if there is no ultimate accountability, then the most logical way for me to live my life would be as a hedonist, someone who just pursues pleasure. And that's what I did. So I lived a very immoral and drunken and profane and narcissistic, self-absorbed, really self-destructive in a lot of ways. That was my life. What people saw was me winning awards for investigative reporting. What they didn't see was the other side, which was me literally drunk in the snow in an alley on Saturday night. I had so much rage inside of me, so much anger. And if you asked me back then, what's the deal? Why, why the anger? I couldn't have told you, but looking back, it's clear what it was. I was always after the perfect high. You know, I, I was always after the ultimate experience of pleasure. But guess what? Everything let me down. Nothing lived up to the hype. So I had a lot of rage. I remember once Leslie and I got in an argument and our, our, our little daughter was there and I had so much rage I just blew up. And I remember I reared back and I kicked a hole right through our living room wall. And my daughter's crying and, Al, and Leslie's crying. It was like, hey, it was, it was just another day in the Strobel house. In fact, I'm going to tell you the ugliest thing about me, which is when my little daughter Allison was just a toddler if she was alone in the living room, playing with some blocks, toys, or whatever, and she would hear me come home from work through the front door, her natural reaction was just to gather her toys and go in her room and shut the door. Is she going to be drunk again? Is she going to be yelling and screaming and, and, and kicking holes in walls? At least it's nice and quiet in here. Friends, that is the ugliest truth about me. Leslie was agnostic. She didn't know what to think about God. And if you've seen the movie on our life, which is on Netflix, by the way, so it's free, um, <laughs> you'll know what happened. Uh, it was through the uh, relationship that Leslie developed with a Christian uh, woman who was a nurse uh, who shared the gospel with her, who brought her to church. And after many months of checking things out, Leslie came up to me and said, Lee, I made a big decision in my life. I said, what? She said, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I thought, oh, no. You know, for an atheist, this is the worst news you can get. Who knew what she was going to turn into, right? Some holy roller or something? I didn't know. All I knew was this wasn't part of the deal. This isn't what I signed up for. First word that went through my mind, divorce. I was going to walk out. But I stuck around, and, and what, a couple of things happened. Uh, on the positive side, uh, there were a lot of changes in Leslie and her character and the way she related to me and the kids that were winsome and that were attractive and, and kind of pulled me toward faith. 
But at the same time, I wanted our old life back. I wanted the old Leslie back. And, and, and so I, I thought, what can I do to get her out of this cult that she's got involved in? And I thought, well, I got a good idea. I'll just disprove Christianity. Because then I'll get her out of this cult and we can go back to our life the way it was. And so I thought, how do I do that? How do you disprove Christianity? Well, actually, I thought this has got to be pretty easy. I think I can do it in a weekend. And here's <laughs> maybe a three-day weekend. Okay, but... Because I knew the key to everything is the resurrection of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, in a variety of different ways, directly and indirectly, made transcendent and messianic and divine claims about himself. He claimed to be the Son of God. At one point, he gets up before a group, John 10, verse 30. And he says, I and the Father are one. And, and the word in Greek there for one is not masculine, it's neuter. Which means Jesus was not saying, I and the Father are the same person. He was saying, I and the Father are the same thing. We're one in nature. We're one in essence. And how did the audience understand what he was saying? They picked up stones to kill him. He said, well, you, you're just a man, and you're claiming to be God. So Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, but so what? I could claim to be the Son of God. You could claim to be God. Anybody can claim to be God. But if Jesus claimed to be God, died, and then three days later rose from the dead, that's pretty good evidence he's telling the truth, right? Uh, that's why the resurrection is the linchpin of the Christian faith. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. What was he saying? He was saying, look, Christianity is an investigatable faith. And if you investigate it and you find that the resurrection is not an actual historical event, you are fully justified in walking away from the faith. That's how bold he was. Well, I was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. I've seen plenty of dead bodies. I've not seen any of them come back to life. And so I thought I can easily disprove that Jesus returned from the dead. And so I want to kind of talk about what I discovered during what turned out to be a nearly two-year investigation into the minutia of the resurrection of Jesus, into the historical data. And I'm going to organize the data for the resurrection using four words that begin with the letter E. That way it gives you a framework. And the reason I want to do this is a um, couple of reasons. Some of you may be like I was. You know, maybe a friend brought you today. You're not sure about this Christianity stuff. And, and so for you, I hope these four E's give you something to think about, about whether or not this is based on fairy tales and make-believe wishful thinking or actual historical truth. And then for those of us who are followers of Jesus, you know, 1 Peter 3.15 says that we are always to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that we have and to do it gently and respectfully. And so this will give you a framework that you can always remember. If anybody asks you, why should I believe Christianity is true? You can say, let me tell you about the four E's. So what are the four E's? I want to emphasize, though, when I did this investigation, I was a skeptic. So I did not give the New Testament any special credence. Didn't consider it to be inerrant, inspired, the Word of God. I do now. But I was a skeptic then. But I had to accept the New Testament for what it undeniably is, which is a set of ancient historical writings. And I knew, just as you can investigate any ancient writings, whether they're by Suetonius or Tacitus or Josephus, you can take those same investigative techniques and apply them to the historical record for the resurrection to try to come to a verdict, is Christianity true? And so that's what I did for a year and nine months in my investigation. So what are the four E's that summarize the evidence for the resurrection? The first E stands for the word execution, that Jesus was dead after being crucified. And I learned very quickly as I did my investigation, there is no dispute among scholars in the field. And I'm not just talking about Christian scholars. I'm talking about the wide range of scholarship around the planet. There is virtually no dispute among ancient historians that Jesus was dead after being crucified under Pontius Pilate. Why? Because when we study ancient history, we're lucky if we get one or, or maybe two sources to confirm a fact. And yet, for the death of Jesus, we not only have multiple 
early first century accounts in the records that are contained in the New Testament. We've also got five ancient sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his death. We have Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who worked for the Romans. Tacitus, another early historian. Meribar Serapion, Lucian. Even the Jewish Talmud admits that Jesus was executed. I mean, this is so well established of an historical fact, you would get laughed out of a major academic institution if you came in and said, no, 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 I don't think Jesus was dead. In fact, no less of an authority than the peer-reviewed scientific medical journal of the American Medical Association conducted an investigation into the evidence for the death of Jesus. Let me quote to you their conclusion, quote, Clearly, the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. In fact, we could go to an atheist New Testament scholar like Gerd Ludeman, formerly of Vanderbilt University, and he'll tell you this, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Indisputable. Now, I don't know how much you're studying ancient history, but there are very few facts of ancient history that a skeptical, critical, atheist historian like a Gerd Ludeman will say is indisputable. One of them is the death of Jesus on the cross. The first E is for execution. Jesus was dead. The second E, I think, is the most fascinating. Stands for the word early. We have early accounts or early reports that Jesus rose from the dead. In other words, reports that come virtually immediately after his death. Why is that important? Because like a lot of skeptics, I used to think that the resurrection of Jesus was a legend. And I knew it took time for legend to develop in the ancient world, so I figured 50, 100, 150, 200 years after the life of Jesus, legends began to develop. Mythologies were spun. Stories were invented. And that's where this idea of the resurrection came from. But what I learn decimates the claim that the resurrection is merely a legend. Follow me on this. I think this is fascinating. We have preserved for us a creed of the earliest Christians. In other words, right there uh, in the first century itself, these Christians would rally around this creed based on facts that they knew to be true. Now, this creed contains the essence of Christianity. It says Jesus died. Why? For our sins. He was buried. And the third day, he rose from the dead. And then it mentions the specific names of eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses to whom he appeared, appeared including opponents and skeptics. Now, what's important about this creed is how immediately it developed after the death of Jesus. Remember we said it took time for legend to develop. Well, we can date this creed. How? Because the Apostle Paul preserved it for us. He wrote a letter. About 22 to 25 years after the death of Jesus, he writes a letter to the church in Corinth. We call it 1 Corinthians. If you want to look up the creed later, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. So he writes this letter 22 to 25 years after the death of Jesus. And in the context of how he writes it, it suggests that he had already given him this creed on an earlier visit. And he was just repeating it in the letter. So, we can date the creed confidently to within 20 years of the death of Jesus. Now, we could stop there, and that would be very impressive, historically speaking. When you consider the first two biographies of Alexander the Great by Arian and Plutarch, written 400 years after his life, and they're generally considered reliable. So 20 years is pretty good, but we can go back earlier. How? Because we know that, uh, that Paul used to be Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor, a hater of Christians. One to three years after the death of Jesus, he's on the road to Damascus. Boom, he has this encounter with the risen Christ. He becomes the apostle Paul. Immediately, he goes into Damascus and he meets with some apostles. Now, many scholars say this is when the apostles gave him this creed that he later shared with the church in Corinth. Other scholars say, wait a minute, it may have been three years later. Three years later, Paul goes to Jerusalem and he meets for 15 days with two eyewitnesses to the resurrection who are named in the creed, Peter and James. And the Greek word that Paul uses in Galatians to describe this 15-day meeting, hysterese, suggests that this was an investigative inquiry. 
They're checking each other out. What did you know? What did you see? What did you experience? They're checking each other out. Many scholars say this is when Paul was given the creed by two eyewitnesses named in the creed. But either way, this means within one to six years after the death of Jesus, this creed is already in existence, and therefore the beliefs that make up this creed go back even earlier virtually to the cross itself. So friends, the point is, there is no huge time gap between the death of Jesus and the later development of a legend that he rose from the dead. We got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. In fact, one of the greatest scholars in this area is James D.G. Dunn. And this is what he said about this creed. He said, quote, This tradition, by that he means this creed, we can be entirely confident was formulated as a creed, as tradition, within months of the death of Jesus. Within months. Friends, this is historical gold. Historians drool over stuff like this. And this is a news flash from the beginning. In fact, Nowhere ever in history do we ever see a legend developing that fast and wiping out a solid core of historical truth. In fact, one of the greatest classical historians who ever lived, uh, A.N. Sherwin White of Oxford, he actually studied the rate at which legend developed in the ancient world. And he said the passage of two generations of time is not even enough for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. We don't have two generations of time passing here. we got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. And that's not the only early report we've got. We've got others in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, elsewhere in the epistles that, that were all circulating during the lifetimes of Jesus' contemporaries who would have been all too happy to point out the errors if they were making this stuff up. Friends, we got an execution. Jesus was dead. We have reports of his resurrection that are so early that you can't write them off as being a legend, but that's not all we've got. We've got a third word that begins with the letter E. It's the word empty. We have an empty tomb. The historical record tells us that Jesus' body was placed in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, member of the Jewish council. It was sealed. Matthew tells us it's guarded, and yet it's discovered empty that first Easter morning. Now, some... Um, critics believe, as I used to believe, that, wait a minute, I'll tell you why the tomb is empty. The body was never really in it. Don't you know they didn't bury crucifixion victims? They left them on the cross to be eaten by birds, or they threw them to the dogs. They, they didn't allow them to be buried. That's why the tomb was empty. Well, wait a minute. I checked it out. What did I find? I found that when you read the Digesta, which is a summary of the Roman law and procedure from the first century, it specifically says that crucifixion victims, execution victims can be buried. Not only that, we have in 1968 the remains of a crucifixion victim who had been buried that were discovered right there some, you know, from the first century. He was executed. They found him with a spike still through his ankle bone. And then, just about two weeks ago, they announced the discovery of another crucifixion victim who had been buried. So we have archaeological evidence that, yes, some crucifixion victims at least were buried. And we have good reason to believe that's what happened with Jesus. So what happened to him? How did the tomb get empty? You know, how can we, how can we know that it really was empty on that first Easter morning? Well, we could talk the rest of the day about all the various strands of historical evidence that established the empty tomb. But I'm just going to give you one fact. Because to me, this this is conclusive. And here it is. Even the enemies of Jesus admitted that it was empty. How do we know? Because when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents of Jesus never said was, baloney, go open the tomb, you'll find the body. That's all they needed to say. It would have put the onus on the disciples to prove it. But they didn't say that. What did they say? We know from sources inside and outside the New Testament that when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now think about that. What is that? That's a cover story. They're implicitly conceding the tomb is empty. They're just trying to explain how it got empty. See what I'm saying? It's like if you're a teacher... And a student comes up to you and says, the dog ate my homework. 
That student's admitting, look, I don't have my homework, but I can explain what happened to it. The dog ate it. It's the same thing. So either um, explicitly or implicitly, both the supporters and the enemies of Jesus are saying the same thing, that the tomb of Jesus was empty. I don't think that's ever been the question of history. We're all conceding that. Really, the question of history is, how did it get empty? That is the question. So you look at the usual list of suspects. The Romans weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. The Jewish leaders of the day weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. The disciples weren't about to steal the body. They didn't have the motive. They didn't have the means. They didn't have the opportunity. I think the best explanation for the tomb being empty is that Jesus physically returned from the dead especially when we combine it with the fourth word that begins with the letter E, which is the word eyewitnesses. Not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appears alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 people, to skeptics and doubters as well as to believers, to men, to women, daytime, nighttime, to groups, to individuals, uh, people uh, talked to him, they, they touched him, they ate with him. And think of this. Remember we said earlier, we're lucky in ancient history if we have one or two sources to confirm a fact? Well, get this. For the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. Friends, that is an avalanche of historical data. And of course, the historical record tells us this experience revolutionized the lives of the disciples. I mean, after Jesus is put to death, they're afraid they're going to get executed. They go into hiding. They're going to go back to the fishing business. And yet, history undeniably tells us just a few weeks later, in the very same city where Jesus has been executed, these once cowardly disciples are now proclaiming with boldness that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. And they were willing to proclaim that message to their deaths. Now, how some of the disciples actually die gets a little cloudy in ancient history, but that's not my point. My point is their willingness to die. We have seven ancient sources, six of them outside the Bible, that confirm that the disciples lived lives of deprivation and suffering as a result of their proclamation that Jesus had risen. Why were they willing to do that? Because they saw on CNN that Jesus had risen? No. Because they read it in the New York Times? No. Because a Sunday school teacher told them? No. Because they were there. Of all human beings who've ever lived in history, the disciples were in a unique position. They were there. They encountered personally the resurrected Jesus. They knew for a fact, is this a lie or is it the truth? And knowing it was the truth, they were willing to die for that proclamation. That tells me something about the veracity of their claims. Friends, I spent almost two years of my life investigating the minutiae historically around the resurrection of Jesus. And it all came down to a Sunday afternoon. And I realized, you know, at some point, every juror needs to reach a verdict. And I thought, you know what, the evidence is in. I'm not, after two years, I don't think I'm going to find some news flash, something I missed. So I said, i got to reach a verdict. So I sat down with all the evidence I'd encountered over this two years, massive volumes of material, and I'm, I'm kind of sorting through it. And then wait, I stopped, and I go, wait a second. And I kind of stepped back and said, you know, in light of the avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. I mean, that was my conclusion. It, it was like the scales just tipped like this. And I realized, based on the historical data, I was convinced Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. And then you know how I felt? I kind of felt let down. 
I, I did. I, I thought it's been two years. Shouldn't, a, shouldn't an, an angel appear about now? I mean, that would be cool. Something, an earthquake would be great. Something dramatic. It was kind of let down after two years. Is that it? Is that it? But then I read a verse. John 1.12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I realized, okay, believing the evidence, concluding, reaching the verdict that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, backed it up by returning from the dead, that's great, that's important, it's not enough. It's not enough. Believe plus receive. I had to receive. Receive what? Receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. And when I would receive this free gift of his grace, then I would become a child of God. And so I got on my knees, and I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and I became a child of God. And I remember... I remember Leslie burst into tears and she threw her arms around my neck and she said, you hard-hearted son of a Baptist, I've been telling you this for two years, hello. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, she didn't say that. <laughs> I always wish she'd said that because that would have been a great story. That, that would have been a great capper if she had done that, but that's not Leslie. She burst into tears and she threw her arms around my neck and she said, oh honey, I almost gave up on you a thousand times. She said, when I was a new Christian, I met some women at church, and I said, I don't have any hope for my husband. He is a hard-headed, hard-hearted legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He will never bend his knee to Jesus. And this one elderly saint put her arm around her shoulder and pulled her to the side, and she said, oh, Leslie, no one is beyond hope. And she gave her a verse from the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, 26. It says, moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so what I never knew at the time, this whole two years that I'm on this investigative journey, what I never knew is every day my wife, behind the scenes, was on her knees praying that verse for me. And can I tell you what happened? Starting on that Sunday afternoon, now that I'd received Jesus as my forgiver and leader, now that I'd become a child of God, and then over time, as I was baptized, as I became part of a vibrant church like this one, as I, as I learned to read the Bible with fresh eyes, as I learned to worship, as I learned to pray, God began to answer Leslie's prayers because my values changed, and my morality changed, and my character changed, and my priorities, and my relationships, and my worldview, and my philosophy, and my parenting, and our, our, our marriage. I mean, all these things over time began to change for the good. And this is always where I would get stuck. Because somebody would say to me, well, Lee, tell me your story. How'd you come to faith? Okay, and I'll tell the whole story up to here. And I wouldn't know what to say. Because what, what, what stuck me was, was, how do I communicate to you? You didn't know me when I was literally drunk in the snow in an alley. You didn't know me when I was living my former life. So what words can I use to help you understand the difference Jesus has made in my life? You see what I'm saying? I, how do I explain that to you? Because you didn't know me back then. And I ask God, what do I say? And the only thing I can say is what happened to my little girl, Allison. Think about this for a second. Here's a little kid, five years old by then, when I came to faith. All she had known the first five years of her life was a dad who was absent, angry, kicking holes in walls, coming home drunk. 
That was her whole life. But starting on that Sunday afternoon when I gave my life to Jesus, you know what she did? She started to watch. Something's changing with my dad. Something's different with my dad. Something is new with my dad. She never studied ancient history, never interviewed a scholar, never studied archaeology. She's just five years old. But she could listen, she could watch, she could observe, and she did. She watched how God changed my life. And it took about four or five months. And then one Sunday morning, she came up to Leslie. You know what she said? I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. And at age five, at age five, my little girl received this forgiveness and gift of eternal life from Jesus, became a child of God. Today, she's married to a seminary graduate. Uh, she's a novelist. She writes works of fiction, but they all have the message of Jesus woven into them. Her and her husband together write children's books about God. She is the mother of two of my four precious grandchildren. And today we're the best of friends. And same thing with my son. My son saw the difference that God was making in his mom and his dad and his sister. And he came to faith at a young age too, but he took an academic route. Got an undergraduate degree in biblical studies. Got a master's degree in philosophy of religion. Got another master's degree in New Testament. And then after many years of research and study at Yale University and at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, he was awarded his PhD in theology. And so now you know what he does? He's a professor at one of the largest Christian seminaries in America, teaching young people about Jesus Christ. And five years ago, five years ago, his wife gave birth to our first grandson and he named him after his dad. Friends, God rescued our family. He changed my son. He changed my daughter. He changed my wife. He changed me. And now next month, Leslie and I will celebrate our 46th wedding anniversary together. So that's my story. That's my story. So let me, let, let me just end with this. Let me just take my story and apply it to you. Remember that equation from John 1.12, believe plus receive equals become? You might be here today because you're like I was, and a friend invited you, and you're a skeptic, and you're not sure about this stuff. And what I said today resonated with you, but you're still on a journey. And I want to say this to you. If you do not right now believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that's okay. It's okay. As long as you do what I did and you check it out. Do your own investigation. Check it out. The historical data is there. But you owe it to yourself to investigate it. The Old Testament and the New Testament both say, if you sincerely seek God, guess what? You're going to find him. You're going to find him. But I'm going to end with this. Some of you may believe, but you're not sure if you've ever received You know, you come to a place like this and and you hear people talk with such passion, right, about their relationship with God. They have a personal, authentic, deep relationship with God. You hear them talk this way, and in the back of your mind, you're thinking, why is it not like that with me? Why, Why does God seem so distant from me? Could it be because you believe the right stuff, which is great, but there's never really been a point in time where you have received Jesus as your forgiver and leader. Receive this free gift of his grace. And thus, according to John 1, 12, become an authentic child of God. I'm just asking the question. You know, the Bible says, these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. God doesn't want you in a state of confusion. He doesn't want you wondering in a state of ambiguity where you stand with him. You can know for a fact that you are adopted as a son or a daughter of the Most High. You can know it. How? When you believe and you receive. You may say, well, how can I believe? I still got questions. Of course we all have questions. That's okay. 
all you need to know for sure right now is Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and he backed it up by returning from the dead. 